question is going to be on fevers. So how you are going to differentiate or how we can differentiate fevers in practice. So as a beginner, uh, even I had a lot of difficulty to prescribe in fever cases. So in chronic cases, we know the approach how to go about. But in fever cases, sometimes it becomes a little difficult. Yeah, so we'll uh, start the session and uh, so that, you know, others can watch later also. So basically, uh, uh, what is fever? Like we all know that fever is nothing but body's reaction to some infection. So it is the elevation of your body temperature and whenever you get any infection in your body. So first of all, what is a, a, what is a normal temperature range? So clinically, if we uh, see 98.6 degree Fahrenheit is what we take as the normal temperature and 98.6, whatever temperature is about 98.6 is considered to be fever or febrile patient. But you have to understand there is always a diurnal variation in your temperature. So if you check the temperature in the morning and in the evening, there is always going to be a difference. Evening temperature is always higher, almost 0 0.5 uh, to 0 0.9 degrees higher than the morning temperature. So this fluctuation is always going to be there. So according to the recent, if you go to the definition which is given by Harrison's, that morning temperature of more than 98.9 degree Fahrenheit and the evening temperature of 99.9 .9 is considered to be as fever. So coming to how can we differentiate different types of fever in practice? So I am going to discuss very common fevers. Uh, for example, what are the fevers which you see in practice? So people, if you can say what, what type of fevers you see in practice? If you can write down in the comment section. Alright, so uh, fevers which we see is malaria, right? Dengue or dengue what we call dengue fever enteric fever and typhoid and nowadays obviously we cannot forget COVID-19 in this pandemic so COVID-19 is the fever which is yes viral fevers are great chunk of fevers right Hethil and also uh, basically these are the fevers which we see in our practice right so we are going to discuss how are we going to differentiate them okay so let's begin with malaria first so what are the symptomatology in malaria? I'm not going to discuss entire symptomatology, right? Which are almost common with all the fevers. So I'm going to discuss salient features which will help you to discuss, uh, dis uh, you know, differentiate in practice. So malaria, if we talk about malaria presence with characteristic chills with fever. So all the malarial fevers, yes. Comal typhoid. So all the malarial fevers, if we see, you will have shuddering, you shivering with fevers. So they will, you will have a distinct chill state, heat state and sweat state. So if you ask your patient's history and in history, if you find out that the patient has chills before the onset of fever along with headache, it is a distinguished feature that the most likely diagnosis in this case could be malaria. Another important thing in malaria, what you see is the type of fever. Yes, can anyone tell me what type of fever you get in malaria? The type is intermittent fever or what we call periodicity is very marked. I've seen so many patients who will tell me that every day at 5 p.m. I get fever or every day at 1 o'clock I get fever. So periodicity is well marked and intermittent fever. What do you mean by intermittent fever? That means that the temperature comes back to normal. So there is a, a temperature spike, maybe about 102. And after some time, there is sweating and the temperature comes back to normal throughout the day also. So there is a spike, normal temperature, spike, normal temperature. Okay, so this is intermittent pattern of fever when the body temperature returns back to normal. So intermittent fever, periodic fever, okay, you have sometimes a fever which presents alternate days after two days, which also helps you in prescription point of view in homeopathy, right? You have remedies where the fevers are, all presentation is alternate day, the fever presentation is every two days, 
which also helps you in prescription or prescriptive totality in cases of malaria. Now this was about malaria. Uh, then the second uh, thing is, uh, yes, Shikhar, what are you saying? Anything uh, you want to talk about? All right. So the uh, second type of fever we are talking about is dengue fever. Now, I, I want people who are attending, can you all please write in the session, how do you differentiate clinically dengue fever? If anyone can uh, tell me if any patient comes to you and how are you going to diagnose clinically? I'm talking about, see, clinic, any patient which comes to you with fever, okay, on examination, on history, you should have some diagnosis in your mind, what we call as probable diagnosis. Obviously, you're not, sometimes you might be wrong, but what will guide you towards dengue fever? Okay, so usually you have to see the seasonal variation also. Dengue fever starts in the rainy season and sometimes it goes on till November, December also. So the peak onset of fever in that season, dengue always presents with high grade fever. High grade fever means on the first day of fever, you will have 102, 103 degrees Celsius Fahrenheit temperature. Along with that, you have severe bone pain, severe bone pain and severe body ache. Okay, dengue fever is also known as bone breaking fever, right? So you'll have severe body ache as if haddi tod bukhar dengue is called as. You will also have pain in your retro orbital region. So behind your eyes, the patient will say, I'm getting pulling type of pain. And sometimes you have dengue presentation with rash also. With someone is mentioning, Hethil, that your red spots, no, you have a rash on your body, which is seen with dengue fever, but that can be seen with other viral fevers also. Okay, so high grade fever and onset, along with severe pains in your joints, bones, all right, with seasonal variation, retro orbital pain, think more of dengue fever. Obviously, if you have a Dengue hemorrhagic fever, patient will have other manifestation of hemorrhage like he may have petechial spots in the body, he may have achymotic spots in the body, alright, he may have bleeding from orifices. We are going to discuss about shortly about the lab investigations also. So this is the presentation of dengue. I remember one patient, I would like to share a short case here. I'll come to detailed cases in the end. But obviously in this COVID-19 situation, everyone is into panic state. So whenever anyone gets fever, the first thought in mind is always COVID, COVID, COVID. So this patient called me that he has high grade fever since uh, two days. So the fever also goes to almost 104 degree Fahrenheit. And it is very difficult that the fever should come. It is not coming out also with antipyretic. Along with that, he had severe body pain, headache, and when he did his investigations, and in investigations, what happened? Uh, CBC uh, was normal uh, because it was done in the initial days. Uh, CBC was normal. His CRP was 90. Okay, C reactive protein was 90. And he got uh, uh, into a state of shock. He has got COVID, and, uh, and the CRP is so high. Okay, so another thing I would like to tell you all that in COVID, okay, in COVID, you have to understand the fever usually, okay, COVID is something which presents with variety of symptoms, variety of symptoms because there are different strains of COVID, right? So sometimes a patient may have diarrhea, sometimes a patient may present with loss of smell, taste, cough, sometimes they may present with fever. So the presentations are different in COVID-19, but According to the observation which I made, COVID-19 fever is always low grade to begin with. Low grade means 100, okay, 99, 100, 101 in the beginning. Okay, later on maybe the fever spike might be high. So to begin with, in COVID-19, the fever is low grade in majority of cases. There might be few exceptions. Chills like shaking, shivering chills are absent in COVID. You might get mild uh, chill feeling in COVID fevers. Another thing you have to understand about CRP is in COVID-19, 
the crp is not so high right in the beginning okay you get rising titer of crp so if you would, would do a crp on third day of covid 19 it might be 20 okay it might be 25 but it not it is not going to be 90 on the third day of fever in covid 19 which could happen in malaria which could happen in dengue okay other infections but not in covid so if you have something called as uh, you are doing in in a phase of cytotoxic uh, storm syndrome which is seen on 10 day of fever you might get a crp of 90 but that is after 7 8 days not on the third day so i had counseled that patient that most likely this is not covid and you are suffering from dengue and later on he tested positive for dengue fever so this are the presentation you have to understand in practice so similarly talking about lab investigations if we come to uh, can anyone tell me okay i would like to have an interactive interactive session so if anyone can tell me how you can di uh, diagnose malaria okay what investigations you would look for malaria if anyone could uh, answer what investigations you would look in cases of fever of, ma of malarial fevers okay so usually uh, you would cbc you will see that hemoglobin is less okay rbc count is little less platelets are less now platelets are less also in dengue fever is less in malarial fevers and hemoglobin is less and you will get peripheral smear from malarial uh, parasite which will show you pyvax okay or you can do a rapid malarial antigen test in cases of dengue you have to see obviously the platelets are less if it is a hemorrhagic fever what guides you that the patient may go into hemorrhage in dengue fevers is hematocrit so increasing hematocrit count is very important to see in dengue patient and the hemoglobin okay that is a hemoglobin might be slightly higher in cases of dengue so why is it hemoglobin show slightly higher in dengue is because of hemo concentration okay in dengue what happens there is lot of fluid loss from the body and that is why you get a false positive result of hemoglobin being slightly higher another thing you have to understand to diagnose dengue is that in dengue fever uh dengue fever the first 3 days if you want to uh, diagnose dengue fever you always do ns1 antigen test right because it is an antigen and once the antibody starts developing after 3 days if you do ns1 antigen it is of no use okay and on the first day of fever if you do igm antibody for dengue it is of no use so first 3 days always go for ns1 antigen in dengue cases and after third day when the antibody develops go for igm uh, antibodies for dengue so this are the lab investigation for dengue i talked about covid crp in covid also you do rt pcr swab test which is most commonly done for covid fever crp ferritin ldh d dimers and interleukin 6 are done to look for what is the prognosis or how infective the patient can go in cases of covid and always covid 19 is presenting with pneumonia so you should do an hr ct or x ray as advised or as you feel necessary in that case so another fever we did not talked about was typhoid fever right so what type of fever do you get in typhoid yes what what is the type of fever you get in typhoid so typhoid presents with something called as continuous fever so uh, what do you mean by continuous fever is the temperature there is temperature rise throughout the day that throughout the day the temperature never comes back to normal and in continuous fever and in continuous fever another thing is that uh, you get uh there is no more rise than 1 degree celsius or fahrenheit increase in temperature yeah step ladder pattern is seen that means the first day the temperature will be 100 throughout the day the next day the temperature might go up to 101 right so slowly slowly the temperature might show rise but continuous so you you get a patient who has 
continuous fever that means the temperature is not coming back to normal throughout the day 24 hours he is febrile and the temperature fluctuation if it is not more than 1 degree celsius or fahrenheit think of enteric fever think of typhoid this is the characteristic of typhoid fever right obviously you have other symptomatology the patient may have associated diarrhea etc but this is very characteristic of typhoid and enteric fever and you have temperature pulse dissociation right so that means with one every one degree rise of or every one degree rise in temperature the pulse rate should rise by 10 beats per minute right which is not seen in typhoid fever that is why you have relative bradycardia so if you have a, a patient with a 100 and 102 fever all right just uh, just for example 102 degree fahrenheit fe uh, 2 degree fahrenheit fever so the temperature okay the te uh, the pulse should be roughly how much so if you calculate um, taking into cal uh, calculation 72 beats per minute is the normal pulse if the temperature goes up to 102 the pulse rate should be roughly around 110 right but in this patient it remains 96 that is relative bradycardia obviously it is not going to go to 60 but slight it is going to be low than expe uh, expected so this is what clinically you need to diagnose typhoid fever how to diagnose it and as everyone knows that Vidal test is not recommended nowadays for enteric fevers and another uh, uh, what you call point in Vidal test is that you can always do it after 7 days of fever. Okay, so you cannot wait for 7 days to diagnose enteric fever because Vidal test is going to come positive only after 7 days and there are a lot of false positive results with Vidal. So the best option to diagnose enteric fever or uh, typhoid fever is blood culture and on CBC when you see leukopenia alright when you see leukopenia with normal platelets always think of typhoid with continuous fever sometimes what happens when patient takes early antibiotics okay if they, if they have come to you by, by visiting with some other doctors so if they have taken uh, antibiotics already or if they have taken anti, anti malarials so the pattern of fever might not be uh, as we see uh, in the regular pattern okay so it might get uh, disturbed because of the medication but otherwise if the patient has not taken any medications you will get these patterns or different types of fever as I mentioned, okay? Continuous fever, intermittent fevers. There are different patterns, different more types of fever. Uh, I think we'll not discuss that today because we also have to discuss about the homeopathic aspect. So coming to a uh, homeopathic approach in fevers. So to be honest, in the beginning, as in uh, I have always, uh, I was, always used to feel that acute cases would be difficult Sorry, am I audible? All right. Okay. So uh, I was telling about yes. I was telling about that uh, in the beginning. I had. Uh, I was going to talk about it. It was very difficult for me also to uh, prescribe on fever cases. But then I uh, referred organon of medicine few things which you have to keep in mind when you prescribe in fever cases is whenever a patient comes to you okay in fever case what are the uh, what things you need to give importance in so the first thing you need to give importance are always concomitant symptoms and the modalities so concomitant symptoms also if you read organ of medicine okay in intermittent fevers if you read Hanuman has mentioned about accessory symptoms in the footnote I think 128 he mentions about accessory symptoms to give importance in cases of fevers. There, which is a peculiar kind of headache, okay, nausea, vomiting. He has clearly mentioned in the footnote 128. Uh, if you have your organ of medicine with you, you can uh, refer to that. All right. So he says that there you have such accessory symptoms like any peculiar pain in any part of the body change in the temperament of the patient, change in the temper, okay? So, concomitant symptoms are the most important symptoms. So, even if you have any mental uh, concomitant. So, uh, you, if, you have, if you have a child who is uh, showing fever, some children, you know, they are, the parents will say, even with fever, they are very active, okay? So, I had prescribed one child recently 
she was very active with also 100 101 fever okay you can also think of opium in such cases you can think of kali sal okay i have prescribed this girl kali sal active uh, patient being active or children being active in spite of such high fever okay so you can uh, think or the child is shrieking crying with fever you can think of stramonium you can think of belladonna so concomitant symptoms are very important to prescribe on as mentioned also by our master Hanuman as accessory symptoms modalities I was talking about okay if you have certain modalities time modality is also very important so as I said if the patient will tell you I get fever only in the afternoon in the evening so time modality periodicity is what you also have to give important and if you have stages in fever chill heat and sweat stage all stages now this peculiar chill heat and sweat stage you will only get mostly in malaria malarial fever all other fevers usually do not show this distinct chill heat and sweat state so if you do not get this then it's all right okay always try to prescribe on the symptoms which are available do not try to uh, dig in for symptoms which unnecessary you will ask the patient ki uh, you know thandi lagti hai kya nahi lagti hai to kab lagti hai he's saying if he is not getting chill state so it's fine okay do not dig in for more symptoms prescribe on symptoms which are available so if you have three stages take into detail that stages another thing is very important are generals okay generals is something which i use in practice so any uh, differentiation in thirst okay increase decrease thirst during fever uh, any acute uh, craving during uh, fever so some patient will come and tell you they crave for juicy things during fever so if you get that craving take it okay if they are not available it's it's absolutely fine and if you do not get major sometimes you also get type of fever as i mentioned continuous fever okay uh, hemorrhagic fevers so that can also be used sometimes for prescribing and your observation okay when the patient enters your clinic is he dull drowsy sleepy all right so dull drowsy sleepy would also point you towards gelsemium nakshmoshata as the remedies tongue of the patient with fever i remember a, a child prescribing rustox on seeing tongue associated with fever talking about viral fevers okay uh, he had fever since two days okay no, 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 no much characteristic to, uh, characteristic to prescribe on and when i saw the uh, child's tongue it had a red triangular tip so on basis of that which I prescribed restox and the child improved within the very next day. So this is the beauty of homeopathy. Okay, so if your remedy is right, specifically in acute cases in fever, the reaction is very fast. Okay, you do not have to wait for days to get reaction in acute fevers or acute diseases. And if you're not getting reaction, so Hanuman has mentioned you get reaction within few minutes, few hours depending on your case okay if you want the reaction to be within hours and if you're not getting the reaction think about changing the remedy in acute diseases in fevers okay if you're not getting the desired effect do not wait for days you do not have that much time as you have in chronic diseases might be your remedy is wrong reassess the case and change the remedy if required in cases of fever all right so this are the few things which are very important in cases of fever while prescribing and if you take into consideration these things i think you'll never fail in fever cases talking about concomitant symptoms okay i think dvcr repertory is uh, filled with concomitant symptoms okay so if your difficulty in finding a remedy you can refer bbcr repertory where he has given concomitant modalities to each stage in chill heat sweat you can get all the concomitants which are available in a bbcr repertory you just need to open the repertory and see so right from your head to toe during fever you have concomitants from uh, in bbcr repertory also including mental concomitants all right so coming to a uh, first case we'll uh, start with the first case if time is there we can take more cases so this was a case of suspected COVID-19. Uh, now this patient did not or he refused to do uh, an RT-PCR for COVID. 
because of the anxiety uh, that he is going to be, you know, uh, quarantine. He was advised to do COVID-19 by multiple doctors, but he refused. And because of that, he was not even consulting any doctor. All right. And he called me almost with, you know, he had uh, uh, almost seven to eight days of fever. And every day he used to get fever. So he said, Ki, uh, doctor, I have fever since almost eight days now. And every day I'm getting fever. So I asked him, why are you, why did not, why you did not consult it in your doctor? He said, I have taken antibiotics for five days and I do not want to do an RT-PCR. So I'm not uh, showing anyone. So, but obviously he is getting fever every day now. So obviously I asked him for more history. So he said he gets fever uh, with slight chills. Okay. So it, it begins roughly around every day, around uh, 3, 3.30. So he said after post lunch, every day he starts feeling little uh, chilly, little chilly that he has to switch on his fan and he has to take covering, not much. And he feels a uh, little cold around 3.30 and slowly, slowly, slowly at that period of time, he knows that the fever is going to start now. I start feeling burning in my eyes and in the evening around 6 to 7, I feel that the temperature spikes. So majority of time what he was doing when at around 3.30, you know, 3, 3.30 starts feeling chill, he used to take Dolo so that he, uh, the fever will not rise. But if he doesn't take Dolo, he said after feeling cold for some time, I would start with burning with my eyes, a mild body ache and then rise of fever. So this was uh, the case. He said, so as I said, afternoon chills. Evening around uh, 6, 7, he used to get temperatures spiked. Every day, this was the scene for last 8 days. Apart from that, he said he had mild cough, not much, uh, which was not disturbing him much, but he had mild cough with no characteristic modality to it. Appetite was decreased. Thirst in general, also everything uh, was normal. Thirst was normal. Uh, another thing which he mentioned in general is that he desires warm food. Since uh, he is feeling ill, he desires that he craves, he wants food which is warm. If the food is little cold, he'll not, uh, no, it's kept for some time, he'll not eat that. So he desires a lot of warm food and fluids during this time. Uh, now recently from few days, he has also started with loose motions. So he had started with loose motion and obviously the anxiety was present along with that. Now, in such cases, in COVID-19 cases, obviously, the anxiety is bound to happen. So, but I advise him that you do not want to do COVID, but you have to isolate yourself completely from your family members. And at least you will have to do a few blood tests. So, when we did his blood test, CBC, normal, CRP was 30, C-reactive protein. And X-ray chest showed left lower zone, left lower zone haziness, pneumonia. All right, so according to the X-ray and CRP and the presentation, this always looked like a suspected COVID-19 case. So according to the symptomatology, if anyone can tell me what remedy you can think of. Anyone who is listening, what remedy comes to your mind? There were no more symptoms to prescribe on. All right, this were the symptoms. I tried to ask him many uh, you know, symptoms also, but there are no major symptoms to prescribe on. This is what he mentioned me on the history. Now, obviously, you have to prescribe on the symptomatology which is available. So, anyone, any remedies from the view uh, people who are watching? Any remedies which comes to your mind? I'll give one minute for you all to think. Okay, Twinta is saying Palsatella evening aggravation. Anyone? Okay, now see the first remedy which I thought, okay, only on history, I did not uh, a repertoire or something. I thought of lycopodium because I thought warm desires, maybe something 4 to 8 aggravation, afternoon fever. I thought it, he could be lycopodium, but 
that is where repertory comes into play. Okay, the rubrics which I took was uh, chill in the afternoon. He had chill in the afternoon, so I took both. He said around three, in between three to four p.m. he gets chill. So I took both the time modalities: chill afternoon uh, at three p.m., chill afternoon at uh, four p.m. Also, general uh, generalities, uh, warm food desires, which was characteristic in him. This was a more characteristic general and which I should not miss in this case. Now, because I did not have any other symptoms, which are all loose motions, no peculiarity to the loose motion, no peculiarity to the cuff. So it's, it's a symptom of the disease with no adding peculiarity to it. All right. So that was of no importance to me. But when I did an x-ray, okay, x-ray showed inflammation on the left side and only on the left lower zone. Okay. So in repertory, I took uh, now, chest inflammation, left lung, lower lobe. So, taking after taking into this symptom consideration, the remedy which came first was chelidonium. Okay, chelidonium was a remedy which came covering all the rubrics. Now, chelidonium, if you say uh, like that, uh, that way it is a right-sided remedy, but in repertory, it is mentioned two marks, okay, synthesis repertory for left lower lobe affection. Left lower low affection, I think there are very few remedies. I think 12 remedies, I don't remember. But chelidonium is one of them. And when I read chelidonium, okay, as we know about chelidonium, warm food desires, right? If you read, uh, read chelidonium from uh, uh, Dr. Clark, Dictionaries of, uh, Dictionary of Practical Materia Medica, he writes, while, uh, shivering feet at 3 p.m. daily, all right, with sorrowful and anxious mood. So, uh, Clark also writes about chill in the afternoon at 3 p.m., which was seen in this patient with warm food desires and left lower lobe or uh, uh, left lower lobe, what you call involvement, at prescribed of chelidonium. And you'll not believe I had given him chelidonium BD for uh, three days. And after third day, he had done his CRP, and the CRP was absolutely normal. Okay, it came back to four from 30. So the infection inflammation was settled. The fever had stopped right from the next day. All right. After that, I did not repeat chelidonium again. Uh, so after the, uh, the x-ray, which was repeated after a week, also came back to normal. So this is what you need to look into characteristic symptoms. As I was saying that give importance to type modality, give importance to concomitant generals, whatever are available in fever cases and correlate with Matira Medica also before prescribing. You need to correlate materia medica. Now, pathological symptoms are also important to prescribe on. Now, I took into consideration left lower lobe involvement, which is very important for me. Side location, uh, the which is also you need to give importance in cases of pneumonia. I feel. All right. So this was a uh, this was one case in suspected COVID. There are many cases of COVID. I think most of the like all the homeopaths are seeing. Uh, COVID cases and which is very good and they are getting a good response. So chelidonium was the first remedy I prescribed in uh, COVID cases. Just because I was ta I'm talking about COVID fever, another remedy I would like to talk about. In a few cases in COVID I had seen where <clears throat> the fever, as I said, it is a low onset to begin with, low grade fever. But later on you get high fever and there are two to three cases where I observed that the fever was continuous in COVID patient. Okay, so throughout the day, there was fever. Uh, 102 fever, throughout the day fever, like your enteric fever. And if you uh, remember, if you see, there has been a correl, they, they are trying to correlate uh, enteric fever and COVID-19. There is some correlation, right? So in few cases, I saw that the fever is continuous in presentation and there was temperature pulse dissociation. Okay, even with 102 fever, the pulse was 96, 97. I was, uh, so this also helped me in selection of remedies in three patients, in which also my uh, teacher helped me and he guided me to the remedy. Uh, the remedy, uh, the teacher, uh, our doc my teacher, Dr. Uh, Prabhakar Devadika, sir. So he told me, Ki think about Baptisha. Why are you not thinking of Baptisha? Because the presentation is like typhoid fever. Right, and as you say, Baptisha is an excellent remedy for typhoid and this bradycardia, okay, with high temperature is seen in Baptisha. 
and then you have all dullness, all the symptoms which you also have in gelsemium are present in Baptisia. So I was trying a lot many remedies, but I couldn't, uh, you know, get results. So Baptisia, just to share COVID experience, that Baptisia was a remedy I tried in almost two to three patients with this symptomatology showing great results. So uh, this was a short uh, case about uh, homeopathy. You, do you want to talk about one more case? Uh, should we uh, share a, one more case detail? Yeah. Okay, I'll take in, uh, I'll tell in a short. So the second case was of malaria. Now, as I said, now again, see the patient had characteristic chills with fever. Okay, so this is how I asked him to do his investigations for malaria. When he came to me, he said, Ki, uh, I'm feeling very uh, cold, I'm shivering, shaking uh, with fever uh, first. And then after that, I get a uh, high temperature and I'm sweating a lot. So he had a chill, heat and sweat state, which was very marked. But this fever, I asked, when do you get this fever? So he said he gets fever every afternoon. So to be precise, he mentioned about 1 a.m. He begins with, oh, sorry, 1 p.m. He begins with fever, with chilliness. Okay, he's shivering with fever. So he's saying entire afternoon is bad. Okay, and he's continuously vomiting. He continuously feels uh, nauseous. All right. And, he, uh, and you know, I cannot sit. I just have to lie down. So there was so much of fever and he was so uh, drained because of this fever and nausea and vomiting. Okay. Along with that, he had body pain, which was very severe, severe headache, weakness. Also, he had said he had get headache on standing. Whenever he was standing, he was to get headache. He needs to lie down in the afternoon. Uh, and this was the symptomatology. On examination, all right, on examination, when I saw him, his blood pressure was very low, okay, 80 by 60 was his blood pressure because he was not tolerating anything orally, he was vomiting with fever uh, and so I asked him a little bit more, what do you feel? So he told me that his chills, uh, this he told me second day, okay, so first prescription I would like to tell you which I uh, was wrong, I had prescribed him Veratrum album. Uh, for the first prescription because he along with that he said he craved juicy things and with so much of vomiting dehydration I had prescribed in Veratrum album but he did not show improvement and as I said in fever cases you should not wait okay and when I did a CBC his platelets were 39,000 okay platelets were 39,000 hemoglobin was 11 he was in a state of dehydration so I did not had much time I had almost uh, half a day to decide if the remedy will act otherwise if it will not act he will obviously opt for hospitalization right so then I asked him again about details about his case okay he said that uh, afternoon as I said he gets fever in the afternoon at 1 p.m it begins with chill and then he told me certain characteristic of the chill that he said that a chill begins in feet okay his chill starts from the feet and then it spreads through throughout the body all right, and the other symptoms which I told you. Again, so this, again, I got a little more characteristic symptoms and he was very anxious and fearful, okay? Very anxious, very fearful, obviously, in during that episode in the afternoon. So, any guesses on the remedy? Twinta, I think I've shared this case with you. So, let others guess. So it's a very common remedy used for malarial fevers. Yes. All right. So again, uh, I repetitize the case that fever in the afternoon, fever at 1 p.m., Chill beginning in feet. This was characteristic for me. 
and obviously he was pers perspiring a lot okay during sweat states of perspiration profuse fever during headache fever with vomiting and anxiety fever with so this was the rubrics which had taken and chill which was shaking any and are still any guesses on remedy okay any guesses the remedy which i prescribed in this case was natrum mule okay if you refer open kent also okay chill beginning in fever uh, feet sorry natrum mule is a three mark remedy very few remedies are mentioned in kent and as we all know natrum mule is an excellent remedy in malarial cases right i'd ask him to take natrum mule 200 dose uh not during the fever paroxysm so du during morning time and you will not believe in that afternoon okay the time he took the dose afternoon he did not get any episode of fever he was much better he vomiting subsided okay only one dose of natrimure and he showed recovery so this doesn't happen in all cases that you get results with one dose only you have to observe how is the reaction of the patient in this case one dose was sufficient and obviously after the completion of treatment had uh, given him a dose of sulfur okay which was also his constitution and as a an antisoric remedy so that there is no relapse of malaria because we all know that p vivax malaria is shows tendency to relapse and like in modern medicine they give primaquine to stop the relapse of malaria in homeopathy almost after every after you treat the malarial cases you should prescribe a antisoric remedy so that there is no relapse and likewise i feel in all acute diseases okay once the acute episode is over always follow up your patient with constitutional remedy uh, antisoric remedy because uh, and hanneman has mentioned in his book also that acute diseases are nothing but latent exposure of your sora so to put back the sora with the new back to normal you need to complete the cure with the constitutional remedy after the acute prescription okay not during the acute prescription whatever acute remedy comes to you prescribe that and after that follow up with the antisoric remedy you will see that the episodes of uh, you know falling ill also will decrease in that cases yeah so uh, this was a few uh, two cases which i shared with you all also uh, if you want to see about malaria we are talking about malaria that is why particularly hanneman has mentioned about intermittent fevers okay and intermittent fevers talks more about malaria what is the methodology what is the time of administration he has given beautifully uh, from aphorisms almost 231 okay 235 it starts with intermittent fevers and as he has mentioned not to prescribe during the paroxysms in intermittent fever okay specifically in intermittent fever and malaria uti okay these are intermittent fevers so in such few cases you try and avoid prescribing remedy during the fever episode because as he has said it might cause aggravation okay if you Uh, if you read his book he has said uh, he has given in footnote about prescribing opium during the fever paroxysm and taking out uh, that the patient is showing drain drain in energy weakness because of the remedy it might cause severe aggravation all right so he has always mentioned to prescribe a uh, remedy before the onset like after the paroxysm is over after the sweat stage is over okay and before the next paroxysms occur so this is the time when you administer during the intermittent fevers and so he has mentioned about different types of intermittent fevers also so we are obviously we are not going to discuss this uh, in this session so in all if anyone has any questions you would like to you know ask about i hope this session was helpful to you, to you all right if any any questions you would like to ask any other remedy which came to your mind in the cases which i dis, uh, discussed so i feel that homeopathic practice is simple all right you just need to focus on your patients you need to focus on the symptoms which are available in your patients it could be 
physical particular symptom could be physical general symptoms it could be mental symptoms so as it's a beginner i have i have a lot of uh, training of prescribing only on mental symptoms okay so in chronic cases also sometimes rely too much on mental symptoms but physical particular symptoms and generals are also equally important okay so do not i, I just want to say don't get too much driven by mind okay and do not try to interpret any symptoms take the symptoms as it is do not try to make interpretation but phys certain physical particulars concomitants if they are available in acute case the what do you call the uh, the results which you get is excellent okay there's a short case about concomitant i remember a case of pneumonia in a in a almost 10 uh, month old infant okay then he was crying shrieking all right when he had typical case where he had you uh, know uh, the respiratory rate was high there was flapping of alien nasi so he, that was a condition of the infant and he was crying and i i we were observing that child in the opd i in that and i observed that when the child the mother used to hold the child in the erect position okay he was he used to stop uh, stop crying okay otherwise again if you make you lie down he used to cry respiratory rate was high flapping of la nasi so he was in a respiratory distress so again any guesses on the remedy and not take much time so at we we had given him antium tard okay if you read antium tard better by sitting erect better in sitting erect position with all the respiratory symptoms of flapping of la nasi respiratory distress and the child improved all right so this in acute cases we a lot of importance to concomitants modalities generals as i mentioned so i hope uh, if there are no questions we would uh, end the session yeah and thank you uh, shikhar sharma for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk on his channel and thank you herbal homeo page and it was great talking to you all i hope the session help you all okay and if you had any uh, any doubts you can write to me i have my facebook page instagram page uh, called as homeo heals i also have my youtube channel name homeo heals if you want i'll uh, put the uh, links in the comment section you can follow up there i keep on posting videos and thank you so much so i'll end the session